Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Just last Sunday, the Olympics ended. And I'm sure if you're like us, you probably watch some of it, maybe a lot. We watch a lot. And um, we saw some incredible displays of skill and, and stamina and courage. And I, it reminded me that back in 1976, Ruth and I had the opportunity to attend the Olympics, the Summer Olympics, when they were in Montreal, in the big O. In Montreal, they always spell it O-W-E, if you understand the implications. <laughs> but we had the opportunity of attending there, and there was a name that still, uh, I remember uh, Greg Joy winning the silver medal right in front of us. And there are names I'm sure stick out in your mind from this recent Olympics. Summer McIntosh, Andrew DeGrasse, De um, Ethan Kartsberg, the great hammer thrower from over in Nanaimo. And, and of course, uh, um, Simone Biles from the United States and many many other names. But you know, when I was thinking about that, I was thinking about a, an Olympic game that took place a long time ago that I would love to have been at. It took place 100 years ago, the last time the Olympics were in Paris, France. This was the 100th anniversary. And um, the Olympic, uh, I, I, w I would love to have been at one particular event and seen one particular runner run. Some of you know where I'm going with this. That runner was, is one of my heroes. His name is Eric Liddell. Eric Liddell was a Scotsman. I've got Scottish roots when you go back far enough. He was a Scotsman. He was a champion runner from Great Britain for the 100 meter dash. And Eric Liddell was slated to run the 100 meters for Great Britain in the 1924 Olympic Games in Paris, France. But before they got there, Eric heard that the 100 meter dash, which was his premium uh, event, the 100 meter dash would be held on the Lord's Day. And Eric felt that it was absolutely wrong to be involved in athletics on the Lord's Day. And so he shocked the British Olympic Committee by saying, I will not run on the Lord's Day the 100 meter dash. Of course, it put them in a big quandary, and there was a lot of negotiation that went on. And then Eric agreed with them that he would run the 400, which was not his premium event. And um, so he prepared for that, and the 400 event was being prepared in the, in the Olympic Games. And there were 60 champion runners that gathered in Paris from 27 different countries to run the 400 race. Some of you, if you ever run the 400, you know it's a great, it's a very taxing event. And um, Eric, he took place in the uh, uh, preliminary runs and he managed to keep qualifying. And then he uh, took part in the seven quarterfinals and again, he qualified. He took part in the semifinals. There were two semifinals, and he qualified again. And the day came for the big race for the gold, silver, and bronze medal. Eric had already said 
God has made me for a purpose. But he made me fast. When I run, I feel the pleasure of God. And so he started to run that event, that 400-meter final, and he ran the first 200 meters all out, which you're not supposed to do. You're supposed to pace yourself. And then when he hit the 200 mark, he decided that he would try and run the last 200 even faster. And that's exactly what he did. And that day, in 1924, Eric Little not only won the gold medal, but he set an Olympic and a world record that stood for many, many years. Some of you will have seen the film Chariots of Fire. I can still hear those runners running across the beach, you know, and hear the music. Beautiful. It tells the story of Eric Little and his decision. But what you probably don't know is that Eric Liddell went on to become a missionary in China. And in 1945, he was in a Japanese concentration camp, and he died about two years before the end of World War II. A man of stamina, but above all, of faith in God. I want to tell you this morning that every Christian is called to live for Christ and to run a spiritual race. You all have a race to run. You all have a purpose in your life, even as God gave Eric a purpose. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Verse 24 and 25. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to obtain a perishable wreath. Interesting, wreath. Paul knew about the Olympic Games in his time. They do it to obtain a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. In Philippians 3.14, Paul said, I press toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of of God in Jesus Christ. We're all called to be in the spiritual race We're all called to run, and the end of that run is going to be when we stand before the Lord in heaven. I want to speak to you about something that I think is profoundly important. I want to speak to you about where you get your power source to run the race. If you followed the Olympic Games, you noticed, especially in the marathon races and the road races, every once in a while they would hand them a little water or hand them some kind of a power bar. Where do you get your power bar? Where do you get your power? From God, exactly. And so I want to talk to you about that this morning so that we can live our lives in a manner that is pleasing to the Lord. What am I going to be talking about? I am going to be talking about the great priority. The great priority, the spiritual priority that every Christian has to spend time every day in communing with God. That's where the power source comes from. That's where the power comes from. A number of years ago, Charles Hamill wrote a little book that I read probably as a teenager. It was called The Tyranny of the Urgent. In that book, he describes 
how the little things in life, the urgent things, the little stuff tends to squeeze out in our Christian lives that which is the most important thing, spending time with God. Spending time in the Word of God. This morning, if you'll take your Bibles, I want to look back. Pastor Keith encouraged us to choose a text of Scripture where Jesus, a little incident from the Word of God where Jesus was involved. And I'm going to look this morning with you at a situation where two sisters were there before the Lord Jesus, and there's a great spiritual lesson. Turn with me to Luke chapter 10, please. Luke chapter 10. Many of you will be familiar with this passage. But I'm beginning in verse number 38. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. Now, let me tell you that all through the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is entering a village. Eventually, he sent out his 12 disciples, and they entered many villages uh, with a mission to preach the good news of the kingdom of God, to cast out unclean spirits, and to heal the sick. And then finally, if you go through the Gospel of Luke, you find out that he sent out 70. So going to a village. And here Jesus arrives with his disciples. Now, let me give you a little bit of background, if I may, to this text where the village is, because it's unnamed here in the text. But if you go over to John chapter 11, verse 1, you find out the name of that village is Bethany. Bethany. It was the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And uh, the little town of Bethany was located on the eastern slopes of the Mount of Olives. How many of you here have had the privilege of visiting Israel. Anybody else? All right. You know about the Mount of Olives, right? You know that on the western slopes of the Mount of Olives are all kinds of graves, tombs, where people are expecting the Messiah to return on the top of the Mount of Olives. You know that in the lower western slopes of the Mount of Olives, you have the Garden of Gethsemane. And then it goes down into the Kidron Valley and up the other side, and you see the eastern wall of Jerusalem and then the eastern gate, which was open in Jesus' time, but is closed right now. If you look to the north, you would see a rocky promontory that was called and is called the place of the skull, Golgotha, where Jesus gave his life and paid the penalty of my sins and yours. That's the Mount of Olives, located about three to four kilometers from uh, the city of Jerusalem. I had the privilege, about 50 years ago, of actually staying in a hotel right on the top of the Mount of Olives called the International Hotel, a huge hotel that had panoramic windows looking down on the Garden of Gethsemane and on the uh, Kidron Valley. And one time I was, uh, I, I had actually gone to Jerusalem with my mother and father and two of my aunts, and uh, I was very concerned about the spiritual condition of one of my aunts, Aunt Helen, who was getting older, and I wasn't sure she was saved. And I said to her, we were sitting at a table in the restaurant overlooking the city of Jerusalem, and I said to her, are you sure that if you were to die, your sins are forgiven? 
And Aunt Helen started to tell me she, what a wonderful person she was, how good she'd been all her life. And I said to her, if being good will get you into heaven, why did Jesus die for our sins on that hill right over there? That's the Mount of Olives that we're coming to in this passage of Scripture. We read here, a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Now, we know a lot about Martha, particularly from John chapter 11, where it was her house, incidentally. And a woman named Martha welcomed her into her house. Her sister lived there, Mary, and possibly Lazarus as well, her brother. But it was her house. And she welcomed Jesus into her house. And I'm sure that Martha who we find out in in John chapter 11 was a woman of great faith. She was a woman that had heard much about the Lord Jesus. And and she not only wanted to welcome him, but she wanted to be the perfect hostess to the Lord Jesus. And so she welcomed Jesus into her house. Have you welcomed Jesus into your heart, your home? What if Jesus came to your house today? Would you welcome him? Or would you have to shuttle some magazines and change some channels that you've been watching? Would you welcome Jesus into your house? She welcomed him. And as we come to this passage of Scripture, I want you to see what happened after that. We're going to look at Martha's frustration. She was a woman that struggled dealing with irritations, and she got frustrated. That like anybody you know? Then we're going to talk about Mary's choice. And then we're going to come to your choice. So in verse 39 we read, and speaking about Martha, and she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Martha had welcomed Jesus into her home. And here Luke tells us that her sister Mary sat at Jesus' feet. She was drinking in the word of God. It was the Son of God, think about it, that was teaching there, and Mary would not miss that opportunity. She was sitting there at Jesus' feet. That's significant. If you look up John chapter 12, you find out that six days before the Passover, Jesus went back to the home of Martha and Mary, and Mary is there washing Jesus' feet with ointment, very precious ointment, anointing him because his feet would be wounded. Six days hence. But there she is. She had an opportunity. She wasn't going to miss it. She sat listening to the Lord Jesus. How do you receive the word of God? Like Mary? I'm not talking about Sunday mornings here. And they're wonderful. How do you receive the word of God? you sit there listening as Mary did at the feet of Jesus? Or do you let the the little things, the phone calls that have to be made, the tyranny of the urgent things, the tension things, do you let them squeeze out that time? 
That's the question I want to ask. Here was Mary sitting in submission, receiving the word of God. And there was Martha. Now, Martha was a, a whole lot more practical person. Martha, she, she believed that listening to the word of God was important. But there were other important things that had to take precedence, right? She, she knew that there was work to do. There were buns to be buttered. There was probably a roast to be carved and a table to be set. And Martha, the slow boil was starting to take over. And I can just imagine that Martha was out in the kitchen there, looking out around the corner, trying to catch Mary's eye, and maybe banging a few pots from time to time, trying to catch her attention, but Mary was oblivious. She kept on listening with total attention in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. The slow boil was starting to take over. And I can imagine that, that Martha began to think in herself, that Mary, she, she's so impractical. She's abandoned me. She has left me to do all the work. That sister of mine. Now, Martha was not the kind of woman that could bottle it up forever. <laughs> you understand me? There was a time when you had to let it out. And she lets it out right here in the middle of the next verse. We read, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him, up to Jesus. Listen to this. She went up to him and said, Lord, that was a good start, right? Lord, but it went downhill from there. She said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Jesus, don't you care what I'm going through right now? Have you ever asked that question? What a question. Does Jesus care? You who are here this morning have gone through a difficult... Does Jesus care? Still grieving some. Does Jesus care? Yes, Jesus cares. Amen? Jesus cares. Do you know there's a scripture in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 that says, Casting all your care. care upon him, for he cares for you. Jesus cares. Martha expected Jesus to set Mary straight right there. But you know who got set straight? Martha. And we see the response of the Lord Jesus here. It's so gentle, so beautiful. He repeats her name twice. He says, Martha, Martha. I can hear my name, David, David. You're troubled about many things. Why aren't you committing them to the Lord? David, David. Can you hear your name there this morning? Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're worried, you're anxious and troubled about many things.
You've let the irritations and the frustrations take over. How about you this morning? Does that resonate? Do you know there's a couple of scriptures that mean a lot to me, and I have to keep turning back to them, quite frankly. When the anxiety comes in, and I was anxious today, quite frankly, not having preached for a long time. But there's a scripture that God gave me, and I want to give it to you this morning. It's in Philippians chapter 4. If you read Philippians chapter 4, you read rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. And then it says this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is what it says in verse 16. Rejoice always. Ruth and I, as you've heard, served for many years in Quebec. And uh, when a believer was going through a hard time, they would say, Philippian cat cat. Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice toujours dans le Seigneur. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. And then Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances, in the frustrations, in the, difficult, in the irritations that you face like Martha. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It is said of John Wesley, who many of you will know, was the founder of Methodism in the late um, 18th century in England, that John Wesley had a wife that was very difficult. She tormented him constantly. She was a very difficult companion to live with. But Wesley attributed his success in his ministry to her and her obstinate character. Why, you say? Wesley would say because he said she kept him on his knees in prayer, asking and trusting God to help him deal with her obstinate character. Maybe you've got a Maybe you've got a, a family member like that. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to verse 18. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Listen to this. One thing is necessary. This is high priority. One thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. If you're going to be effective as a Christian for God, you have to choose that one thing. I'm speaking particularly to the young adults here. Learn to spend time in communion with God every day. That'll change your life. Learn to spend time in the Word of God every day. God will bless that. Amen? 
Be faithful. Mary chose the good thing. Do you want to know what the good thing, the, the portion that Mary chose was? It was spending time hearing the teaching of the Word of God, letting God plant it in her heart. Colin said, I love the word of God, and I do. I give God all the glory for that. I had a daddy who loved the word of God too. And I had a mother that was a prayer warrior. And that made a big difference for me in my life, let me tell you. Let me ask you a question. Do you spend time every day reading and meditating in the Word of God? Are you faithful? Or are you letting the little stuff squeeze it out? I picked up one time an old Bible all, I love old Bibles, they're all worn, don't you? Underlined, I wish you could see my mother's Bible. My mother was killed in 2006 in a terrible traffic accident that took my brother's wife as well. And it was on a highway out of Portland, Oregon. A driver crossed the line hit them head on and killed my mother and my sister-in-law almost immediately. There were flames that engulfed that vehicle. And somehow my brother, her husband, and the little baby and my niece were able to get out. My brother believes it was an angel of God that helped him out. We saw the vehicle later totally incinerated, but we found one thing, my mother's Bible. There it was, kept in the midst of that fire. I have another friend that I would mention. Oh, I, I know where I was starting to go with that story. I saw this old Bible, and on the cover it said, either sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. Hear that. Either sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. I have a friend that was involved in our first ministry back in Dorval, Quebec, suburb of Montreal. And he went on, by God's grace, to be a missionary. Wonderful story. He went on to be a missionary in the jungles of Peru. And his motto was, no breakfast, no Bible. That's how serious he was about his commitment in the Word of God. And I want to challenge you this morning about your commitment. I want you to turn just in closing. I want you to turn with me back to the Old Testament, to Psalm 119. Now, many of you will know that the book of Psalms is the longest book in the Bible. And you also may know that Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses. Psalm 119 is divided into 22 sections, and each section begins with a subsequent letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And I'm looking with you this morning at the second uh, section, which begins 
in uh, verse number 9. And a question is asked. It's a question for young men, but it's a question for all of us. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the ways of your testimony I delight as much as in all riches. And the last two verses to me are very, very important. Verse number 15 says, it's a commitment to God. Where David said, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your way. I will meditate. Do you know that God promises to bless you? Listen, young people particularly, and older ones. God promises to bless you if you will meditate in his word. Joshua 1.8, this book of the law will not depart from my mouth, but I will meditate on it there day and night. Then I will make, I will, my way will be made prosperous. God promises that. Psalm 1 talks about being like a tree planted by the rivers of living water, letting the word of God feed our soul. Meditation. What is meditation? Someone has called meditation the gymnasium of the soul. That's where we get our spiritual workout. Now, what you, many of you don't know is that I had meningitis 10 years ago, very bad. And God spared my life. But after that, I had lost a lot of my memory. And I read, I was reading in the book of Psalms and meditating, and it's just a delight to see Pastor Joe here this morning. The book of Psalms makes a great, a great encouragement when we're going through serious illnesses. And I was meditating, I would... I took the Word of God and I began to type it out on my iPad. I, our pastor has an iPad. I don't know how he follows that, but he does when he preaches here. But I began typing it out and I read it so that I remembered what I had written. I, I, I wrote it out. I typed it out. And I want to say to you, if you want to effectively meditate on the Word of God, you have to read so that you can remember it. Read it. If you take means take using a journal, use a journal so that you remember it. And then this is where the gymnasium of the soul comes in. Come before God and ask God to speak to your heart through the Word of God. That's meditation. And if you do that, God will bless you. God will bless you. I encourage you, if you're here this morning, you haven't been faithful in the Word of God. You want to find a book to start? I've been reading in the Gospel of Luke. It's wonderful. It may only be six or eight verses a day that you read, but read it to remember it and then pray it back to God. And God will bless you. Final point in verse 16. The psalmist says, I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. The New International Version has a little more clear. It says, I will not neglect your word. Have you been neglecting the word of God? Have you been neglecting the word of God? Have you been faithful this past week? If not, it's sin. It's sin that needs to be confessed. And then you need to choose somewhere where God's leading you to study, be it the Gospel of Luke or wherever it is. And I commend to you journaling. I commend to you journaling. And finally, I encourage you to tell God about your commitment. And maybe tell somebody 
that's real close to you, that you really trust, that you really trust that you've made Mary's choice. What was Mary's choice? Well, let's remind us. Last verse, Jesus said, Mary has chosen the good portion. Will you? Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Do you believe your prayers are eternal? You look at, at Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 5 and you find out that the elders, the prayers of God's people are kept eternally. This is the important stuff. It's going to require commitment on your part. It's going to be, require a decision. But may God grant you the power to make that decision this morning. Let's bow in prayer. Lord God, I praise you for your word. I praise you for this story in the word of God. And Lord, I pray that even right now, people would be making that decision, making Mary's choice to choose the good portion, to repent of sin, to turn back to God, to commit themselves this week to spending time in the word of God. Bless this church family, Lord. Bless our pastor and Carrie that are away right now too. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.